Thank you, everybody. Um, and good morning. So it's uh, Wednesday the 13th, 10 o'clock. Uh, it's a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, good to see you all. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about what we're doing today and for the balance of the week. Um, as you know, we're still um, under uh, you know, COVID only bills, but we're right on the verge of being allowed through a list that rules committee has been reviewing and is gonna be moving uh, things off the wait list to the sort of the action list. And so for instance, I think we will probably be taking up something like our energy efficiency bill from January 337, uh, very soon uh, on the floor. And we'll also start to get into other bills. Two of the major bills that we got over from the House um, are there's an Active 50 bill and Global Warming Solution Act. So we're not cut loose to start working on those things, but I think um, we've known that Active 50 is coming our way in more than one way. Uh, there's the Active 50 bill itself, there's the Senate Housing Bill that includes many sections related to municipal planning. Um, and, uh, and the House also has a housing bill. So uh, we'll, we'll be addressing uh, Act 250 issues. Uh, the, the question is, uh, how much time is this committee going to be given? And that's going to give us um, some useful guidelines to know how deeply we can go on how many issues. But so that's, uh, that's why we're, well, it's still not crystal clear what our schedule is going to be. But meanwhile, uh, one of the things that's been out there coming up repeatedly for years is uh, trails and trails regulation in Vermont. So uh, today I just hope that what I'd like to do is we've got people with us to help us talk about how we regulate uh, trails in the state of Vermont. And, so we're not really we're not here to talk about H926 or language in 926. Um, I had also talked to uh, Ms. Chakowsky about the jurisdictional opinions that have been issued related to trails. Uh, they're posted on our website. They've been sent out to everyone. We're not here to actually walk through those, but I thought committee members may well want to read through because it gives you a good feel for the kinds of um, choices that get made, the discretion involved, the analysis involved, and the, I think they're useful background reading. They are not part of today's meeting. I'm not here to sort of become an adjudicatory body. I'm really, it, it's titled a primer on trails regulation in Vermont. So that's the goal, just to help get the legal landscape clarified for this committee so we know what applies and we'll basically trying to set up a clean slate on the issue. And then we'll have an opportunity to come back to it um, when we're doing Act 250, some Act 250 bill. So does that make sense to folks? Any questions, Can, comments? It, yes, I would, I would like to pipe in. Yeah, please. Um, so from my perspective, the trail issue, uh, as I wrote um, in my email to the committee the day I couldn't be with you, I see as urgent. We have one trail system up here that's not gonna, that may not be able to uh, open at all and an other trail system in turmoil. Um, <laughs> tourism is taking a huge hit in this and this area cannot afford to have those trails uh, not operating and bringing at least some I'm people- I'm here, but I'm gonna be very quiet. So um, I would just like to propose to the committee else that we act on trails. Diane, uh, is that you? Diane? Okay, sorry. Are Good, you, morning. Good morning, are you Chase sure We, we hear you and see your, your label. Okay, so back to Senator Rogers. All right. Um, I, see it, I see the trail thing as urgent uh, the groups have been meeting. There's very simple language to deal with it with a sunset to allow them to function this year till we can get back to uh, hopefully some, I don't know if this is gonna work. some new normal because I don't see Act 250 as a bill that we should move forward based yeah, on I this. Yeah, I mean, I'd really like to be able to concentrate and I, and I thought I 
The rest of us would like to be able to concentrate too, but somebody um, mute hey, Miss Greg, Snelling. maybe you could reach out uh, to Diane and let her know. Can uh, can try and see when, when LT might Thank be able you. to do this. Chair whoever's, Snelling, can you hear Whoever's running your, our meeting your, should uh, be able to okay. meet her. They're, they're asking to talk to me, so. I'll give her a call right now. Okay, Sorry thanks, about Greg. that, everyone. Thank you very yep. much. Yep. Here we go. Just like when she was in committee, she's very unruly. Okay. But I just, I just think, Senator Bray, that the, the whole Act 250 thing, um, it's a huge issue that a lot of people want to take part in and, and weigh in on, and I don't see it happening through this format. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, so I, your point's well taken. Um, actually, we distributed your memo to the committee, and prior to... Um, talking about it we had already as we were all on the same page we said you know here's outdoor recreation may be an economic Hello. development right spot and so um let's try hey, Greg. if we can uh, diane could you mute yourself while you're on the phone with your broker thank you <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a prime example of why act 250 shouldn't be done on zoom right there yeah well uh, Bray, okay. uh, I was trying. Now it says I'm on mute. Am I on mute now? Uh, you're not. No, no. Just, okay. You're not. If you could just mute your phone, that'd be great. Whoever's running the meeting should be able to. I, mute I keep phone. muting her, but she okay, unmutes there she goes. Gotcha. Right. So I Hold see. Up. Up to looks, looks good for the moment. Okay. So, yes, there, there are definitely technical challenges for doing stuff by Zoom. And I know that when we do markup on bills, it's very handy, especially on big bills, to have us all at the same table, page by page, line number by line number. Um, so we'll see how much we take on. But uh, so, Senator Rogers, by way of reassurance, we I think the committee was oriented to trying to figure out something on trails. What we're we're not prejudging how much we're getting done right at the moment in part because we don't really know how long we have. Um, so th that's why today is less about the NEK trail situation and much more about, well, okay, so step away from that and look at what are all the rules and regs related to it so we know what the legal landscape looks like before we start getting into particulars. Senator Campion. Uh, thanks. I, I, for me, I see three things. If we're going to look at Act 250 at all, and I'll just put this on the table, I think we look at forest fragmentation, trails, and downtowns. Uh, they seem to be things that we're all hearing from a number of people on. We kind of loop those together and send them out. So that's where I am. Um, you know, the forest frag piece, the trails piece, and then and then the downtowns. Okay. So, well, if anyone, I, else, if I, anyone else want to offer a snapshot of where they think we might get going, uh, Senator McDonald and Senator Rogers. <laughs> Before we have the auction, could we see the goods? Yes. Point well taken. That's why I'm trying not to get into bill edit mode. <laughs> the issues around trails. Yes. I look forward to that. Okay, me too. All right. Uh, since everyone I else believe is the, jumping I believe in. the commissioner could offer us some language to look at that the, that group has been working on it but i yeah. i see the trails as urgent and none of the other stuff is urgent so i don't understand i don't we, understand trails can we understand and decide for ourselves whether or not we believe it's urgent so great okay so everyone else on the committee's jumped in senator parent uh do you have anything you want to say about what we do around Act to may or may not take on an Act 250 at the moment before we go back to our previously scheduled program, which is the full background on trails. Yeah, I think just if, if we're gonna do anything at all, just narrow it in scope and, and try to, I would almost see if there's anything we can do to build for next year, not anything necessarily that passes and changes the law, but I think we should spend that time for next year so we can jump on it. My worry is with the house, they took so long to get us a bill that I believe that we'll have to go through this again next biennium. Okay. All right. So I think, uh, Senator Campion, you were... were well, I just want to say, you know, I think we need pieces in forest frag, we need pieces in trails, and we need pieces in downtowns. 
we send those in a package, we're likely to, you know, we just have to think about this politically too, what we're giving the governor, what he's interested in. You know, there's 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 opportunity in getting all of this at the same time. So I'll just okay. leave it there. Right. Thank you. So uh, in uh, speaking against my own thing of that we're not here to negotiate what's in or out of a bill, uh, I'll just, as a reminder, twice this committee has passed out language on forest frag and we were unable to get all the way to the finish line with that. So I know there's a, a longstanding history in being able to work on that. Uh, okay, so with all that um, preamble, then I'd like to go back and start on um, the, ag the agenda as uh, shared today and ask Ms. Chikowski to uh, come, up bat come up to bat first. Um, can you, Phyllis, give the committee a bit of a primer on trail regulation in the state, knowing that uh, there are others who can also contribute uh, to filling in that picture today as well for things that aren't necessarily, I know that we're not asking you to take care of all aspects of trail regulation in Vermont, but get us started, please. Sure. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. So uh, I do think I will need assistance filling in some of the, the areas, particularly from Commissioner Snyder, who is primarily in charge of um, the administration of the trails program. So um, there are lots of different um, aspects of laws that may in, uh, impact the development of a trail. Um, chapter 20 of Title 10 establishes the Vermont trails system. It delegates the power to administer that program to the Agency of Natural Resources. And so it defines trail as an area of land for hiking, walking, biking, cross-country skiing, snowmobiling, ATVing, horseback riding, and other similar activities. So that's sort of the realm of, we're, of what we're talking about. Um, that's a wide variety of activities. And so one of the challenges when we're talking about trails is the variety of activities and variety of um, uh, appearances that trails take on. They can be as simple as um, a small narrow dirt path to something much more extensive, including lots of um, built up areas and paved areas and construction. So it's really a large universe, but the chapter 20 language refers to the Vermont trail system and it gives the agency the power to recognize trails as part of that system and trails that have been recognized as part of that system are for a state or a public purpose. So that is uh, important later when we talk about Act 250, but it also gives the agency the power to establish criteria um, in order to uh, come up with the criteria to recognize for recognition as a trail. So then there is Act 250 also. So. Mm -hmm. Act 250. Can I? Yes. A quick question. Um, mm -hmm. How long has there been such a thing as the Vermont Trails system that, you know, under ANR management jurisdiction? I think it is from uh, 1993 is when the, stab uh, the statute was enacted. Uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 20 was enacted in 1993. However, I can't necessarily speak to if it's been around sure. longer than that. Uh, I'm not sure if Commissioner Schneider has more information on that. Okay. Uh, I just, but, I didn't, thank you. I just wanted to have a sense of how long, how old the, at least the uh, basic underlying language is, thanks. Sure. Oh. So, um, Thanks. An so another aspect is Act 250. So Act 250 comes into play whenever there it, uh, is the land use development law. And we haven't talked about it much in this committee in a while. So briefly, um, Chapter 151 of Title 10 requires that <laughs> uh, any the creation of subdivisions or construction of a development requires a permit under Act 250. So determining if you have 
if an act if an activity is development is one of the crucial decisions and that determines whether or not you need an act 250 permit so in some cases trails are development it really is highly fact dependent because these trails as i mentioned come in a variety of shapes and sizes and have a lot of different um, activities that can take place on them so it's highly fact specific but it follows the traditional active uh, act 250 uh, jurisdictional analysis to determine if you need an act 250 permit um, there are potentially some other types of laws that could uh, govern trails um, that I don't know a lot about, but wetlands are potentially an issue that could come up if there is construction in an area where there is a wetlands. Uh, wildlife endangered species habitat is also a potential issue and potentially wastewater. So there are a variety of laws that could govern the construction of a trail. So would you like me to talk more about Act 250 or would you like to hear more about the trail system regulation broadly? Um, let's do a both, please. Uh, so, you know, do you, you, do you want to hear from, so do you want me to go through the sort of analysis of what Act 250 analysis needs to be done to see if it applies to a trail or? Sure, so I guess here's one beginner question. If Act 250 jurisdiction doesn't apply to a trail, then what body of regulatory law applies to that trail? It's not entirely unregulated. It's like Act 250 or nothing. Uh, so it depends. I think we, I just mentioned it could have wetlands issue or wildlife issues. Yeah. It really will depend on where it is. Um, and potentially municipal regulation, although I'm not certain, I, I don't know a lot about municipal um, regulation of trails, but right. it, it would, if it was a development, you would sort of look at the general, what you're doing when you're um, constructing any kind of development, if you're going to run into issues with either wastewater um, or other municipal regulations. Okay. Um, and so the threshold that brings you into Act 250 or not, can you walk us through what it is that would bring you in or would exclude you, please? Sure. So development requires a, an Act 250 permit. And that is the, the large definition in Section 6001 um, the sort of main questions refer to, um, is it for a commercial or industrial purpose or is it for a state, county or municipal purpose? Um, so that relates to the, the, the jurisdictional triggers of the, the tr traditional 10 acre threshold or the one acre threshold. So, if you're uh, constructing improvements for a commercial activity in a town that has permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, there's a 10 acre threshold. So is, your, is the land involved 10 or more acres? If there isn't permanent subdivision bylaws, it's, is it on one or more acre? Um, it's relevant if it's a commercial purpose or a state or municipal purpose because the calculation of involved lands is slightly different. So if it's for a municipal or state purpose, it, the involved lands are defined as what is physically disturbed as opposed to the entire tract of land, which is what the, the calculation is for commercial purpose. So um, is purpose not ownership that you're talking about here? Yes. Okay. And um, and then the so the two categories, it's commercial 
or its uh, state municipal purposes. Right. And what if someone has trails that are, um, they just they, they just have ter- they have a great set of bike trails on a large property and they like to let uh, friends and neighbors use it for free. Is there, a, where's that land in this spectrum? They're not charging, so it doesn't seem very particularly commercial. And, but it's not open. It's not necessarily open to the public, and it's not. So how do you how do you classify that? Um, so that's a nice kind of tricky example. So it's probably a private um, for a private purpose. Um, if it is closed land that isn't open to the general public, and they're not charging a fee, um, the analysis is probably a little more detailed than that. Um, but if it's someone's own private property of which they're using and maybe just their friends, that's probably not a commercial purpose. Um, so that's probably just a private purpose, at which point potentially wouldn't need an Act 250 permit. Okay. So depending on purpose and whether or not you have permanent bylaws in the town, there's a there's the acre threshold. And then you were starting to make a distinction. Can you go back to that between um, disturbed land versus size of the parcel involved overall. Right. So, so generally, the the sort of state, municipal, county projects, um, the calculation is slightly different. It's land that is physically disturbed. Um, this is sort of the uh, calculation that we use for for. Uh, benefit to the public. And so uh, it's different than the actual size of the tract of land involved. So uh, for commercial purpose, the the 10 acre or one acre threshold applies to the entire tract where the pro- where the project is taking place. But when it's for a municipal county or state project, it's for a you you look at the amount of land physically disturbed, which is usually a smaller amount of land. So it takes a it takes a larger amount to reach the actual threshold. Okay. <clears throat> so a commercial project that might actually have a modest amount of disturbed land, let's say even under one acre, but if the parcel itself is uh, larger than an acre and there are no permanent uh, bylaws, then Act Two Hundred and Fifty would be invoked. Right. Uh, there is another layer for trails. Um, rule 71 of the Act 250 rules um, applies, to, applies to recreational trails and that limits the jurisdiction to the corridor and the area directly and indirectly involved. So there's a further calculation when we're specifically talking about trails. So one of the the issues is that this is a comp uh, a complicated calculation that has to be done as you sort of wind through what are the various components of the trail you're talking about. So, Mr. Chair. Yes, please, Senator McDonald. Per- perhaps some. I want to thank the test. Thank for the testimony we just had. Could someone share with us what it is that um, folks are seeking to do? to implement trails that um, is being prevented by Act 250. And so rather than just, just go through the law now, what is it great question. We, we seek to have happen and where are the impediments that might be resolved? Ms. Schakowsky, you're not really a party trying to move something, but uh, you've been around this. Can you characterize what you're seeing as the, in response to Senator McDonald's question? No. Okay. Well, um, is there more to your uh, uh, introduction right. that you would I'll like one to other add thing. before we go on to others who can speak to those? Sure, I'll add one final thing. So I mentioned chapter 20 of Title 10, which is the Vermont trail system. It declares that trails under that system are for a public purpose, which translate under Act 250 for the state municipal county purpose. So trails that are part of that system 
um, use the physical area disturbed calculation. Okay. Great. All right. Any other legal lay of the land questions for Ms. Schakowsky at this point? Okay. Not seeing any. So thank you for getting us started. Um, I'd like to go on to Commissioner Snyder to fill us in some more. Um, again, so we're trying to do mostly big picture, but you know, Senator McDonald has also asked a question that ultimately we'll be coming back around to, like, what are people trying to get done that they're not currently able to do as in a set in a manner that's satisfactory to all the parties? So sure. good morning, thank you. Good morning, thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. I appreciate the chance to visit with you all on this this morning. Um, and uh, I guess I jump in. Um, I'm prepared to explain all kinds of background, uh, history, how we got here. Um, but I jump in here uh, to be concise to start with um, basically picking up on two things I've heard. One from uh, Chair Bray uh, mentioning early that the folks have been working on this, talking about the trails issues in Act 250 for several years. So that's important to know, because I think, you know, there's a, been a couple of high points along the way or, or touchstones of, of activity, and um, I'll clarify those. The other piece would be Senator McDonald's uh, question here. Um, and I, uh, I'll insert there that while there's an awful lot to unpack and understand about Act 250, how it works um, relative to trails and the different kinds of trails, the Vermont trail system, et cetera, um, really, I think we can all kind of focus here by remembering that it was what S Senate Bill 276, I think that became Act 47 of 2018 actually directed, you, the General Assembly, directed the chair of the NRB and myself as commissioner to undertake, to engage with stakeholders um, and to consider internally an alternative to Act 250 for the regulation of uh, recreational trails. That's actually the, the question, it, that we were, we were, there was a legislative charge to consider an alternative to Act 250 reflecting the difficulties, lack of clarity, and various challenges that have been, um, that have uh, come to, um, to, to broad understanding, I think, uh, it, that exists. So there was, uh, prior to 2018, there was, you heard testimony, I was there, there were others, I provided input from the, um, um, uh, from Montreal's and Greenways Council at that time, indicating that there were a handful of topics that they that it, they suggested was broad agreement could be at least more clear in the current administration of Act 250. Uh, even even going to things like the definition of a trail in Act 250, uh, definitions of involved land and others. So there was this sense that there were there was confusion and there was lack of clarity and in some cases lack of consistency. That was brought to you all, and the response was, let's consider um, uh, ways to uh, imagine Vermont's, uh, first take stock of the importance of Vermont's recreational trails for uh, a lot of dimensions of life, and then consider how are they um, considered under Act 250, and might there be an, an alternative uh, approach to um, planning and overseeing them with the idea that I don't think anybody disagreed that trails are good, trails are particularly good and important in Vermont, and that they need to be built, used, and maintained appropriately with respect to it, importantly, especially environmental quality. Um, and so that was established. They're good, they're important, we need them, and Act 250 is kind of gummed up. So, Madam Chair, Mr. Commissioner, please go work on this and, and report back. That was at the time of the Act 250 at 50 Commission. Uh, we reported to that commission. We held stakeholder uh, groups. This is uh, where it, where you then had the um, the origins of the Vermont Trails Alliance, which is a uh, nonprofit that was formed to work in this space, uh, working with the Forest Partnership of. Uh, Whereas the Vermont Trails Alliance, a subset of member organizations from the Vermont Trails and Greenways Council that exists in statute to advise the agency on all kinds of matters related to outdoor recreation, including trails. 
Uh, the VTA uh, was formed to help with this, uh, to represent those interests on kind of the trail community side, volunteer member-based organizations that remember, we're unique in this state that most of our 5,000 miles of trails are on private lands uh, with the generosity of private landowners, most of them built and maintained by volunteer member groups. At the same time, we were also concerned about the environmental uh, considerations. And so the forest partnership, uh, which uh, you know, Warren and Jamie are here and they can speak to both of these groups that they represent, but the forest partnership being a, an association of environmental uh, groups with interest in trails that they formed and we all work together and have spent two years contemplating really that first charge. Is there an alternative? Could recreational trails be um, designed, promoted, planned and overseen um, in a different way than a Act 250 based regulatory framework? And that there's been an awful lot of work on that. And um, significant progress and agreement uh, with a couple of final pieces not really come, uh, haven't been, a, uh, uh, haven't, they haven't reached final agreement on everything, but we're able to bring forward to uh, the House Committee on Natural Resources um, a proposal for, which is dangerously, getting me dangerously close to talking about the bill right now, Senator Bray, and I, I do understand the instructions, but to provide the context, that's what that's what this is about, is um, there is a, a broad agreement on the need to make some clarifications. There's broad agreement on a potential alternative mechanism for oversight of recreational trails in the state, presumably to be housed at the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation on a kind of analogous, as, as I think of it, and as I've come to understand it, to the way we handle water quality protections for logging um, with a technical assistance, best practices um, approach, uh, but doing so for trails. To, that is to have a BMP based system where all the different types of trails and trail users have a different set of approaches to building trails, but they would be expanded to consider beyond the impact of a trail on water quality or wildlife habitat, but also the attendant uses of um, parking lots and kiosks and traffic and human waste that we'd have to expand this notion of best practices to, and technical assistance for oversight of trails. Uh, they've worked uh, wonders to come together on this broad agreement that's been put forward, but they basically have said, we need a little more time to figure out actually how to make that work. So in the interim, we're proposing some fixes um, to Act 250 to these points that need clarity, uh, that would give that clarity and maybe have a bit of a pause in some respects for an interim period while these groups continue to work with the NRB and myself and our staff to come up with this alternative approach to oversight of, of trails, uh, but, but kind of pausing on stuff in the meantime. So that's, that's the question that we've been asked to address. I've tried to quickly give you what is a very long history, but the high points are, we were asked to address an alternative. We've done that. There is a proposal before the General Assembly. Uh, it is right now, what's the House passed version has kind of a, uh, some interim steps that give clear, clarity and, um, and, and predictability, um, but also buy time, because those, those interim steps would sunset according to that provision, uh, to give a limited period of time for groups to continue to get to this the, the real grail, which is an alternative approach to considering trails, all circling back to this idea of a, the vision of a world-class recreational trail system in Vermont that is not only world-class in terms of the thrills and enjoyment of the users, but that it's well-planned, it's, it's consistent with local community objectives, uh, and, it's, it, and it works. Uh, that's the goal, and that's why we're talking. Okay, so let me just jump in. So thank you for that filling us in on how we got to where we are. Um, the proposal, in what form does the alternative regula regulatory proposal exist? I know there was some language added through an amendment on the floor to the bill that shall not be talked about. But the what is there a proposal that's bigger and more it's sort of solid than the amendment that we can look at. 
So the amount, right, the amount is pretty and that it gets, it says, you know, that they'll make these clarifications and that some of those would sunset. Uh, and it and it gives some language to direct a, a, a nudge to these groups to continue to work on this alternative approach. That approach is not spelled out in the amendment, the, the floor amendment in the House bill. Um, but I believe uh, Jamie Fidel and Warren Coleman, uh, I've watched them present the, the broad strokes of that thinking to the House committee. I, I expect they would be ready to provide that to you as well, which is that more detail of what, what they're contemplating in this alternative approach to oversight unnecessarily regulation of recreational trails. Okay. Um, well, that's very helpful. Uh, yeah, and you know, I'm glad that you dipped back to reminding us of all, um, you know, the value of the trails, how extensive they are. I think, you know, we sometimes we can get uh, bogged down in the sort of regulatory uh, muck, you know, sort of the areas of confrontation and friction, stuff like that. But I, I think the committee's 101% uh, behind the idea of having, you know, a world-class trails network in the state and having it be part of uh, our economic future as well as helping that trail system um, continue to provide environmental and habitat benefits and clean water benefits, all the things you know that you've so great. Uh, anything more you, that you want to add, or is there any committee questions for Commissioner Snyder? I'm happy to take the questions, and um, you know, I think it's important to hear from the others. I'm here. I'm eager to stay part of this. Uh, as far as adding things, I, I just want to be responsive to your questions. So I can leave it at that. I think that's the main points. Is that there is a lot of background. Um, I guess maybe I would just add this. I think another piece that I've been pleased in watching for years now is that the broad agreement also includes um, a sense that there are trails and then there are trails and there's different kinds, they're, they're not all the same. And, and that some trails would seem to be a no brainer that they don't need this level of oversight and regulation, whereas other trails might. And that's what we're trying to ha have is, a, is that there are many different kinds, there are many different ownerships and different managements and that gets challenging, but it's not beyond us is what I'd like to suggest. And that the thinking includes a robust approach that respects private rights and public benefits uh, and really ties to this notion of public purpose uh, through the Vermont trail system. And I would just say, we are really pleased to be part of this, really want to get through and move on um, feel like we're close, uh, and I think the department and our staff and our partners are eager, feeling like we got this. Um, we just need to be allowed to move forward to make it work. Um, that said, um, Jamie and Warren will probably won't roll their eyes at this point, but I have to say that I just have to be on the record saying that as eager as we are to help with this, we can't just have a new program um, launched at the department without new capacity and resources to make it work professionally. And um, I, I don't like being the skunk at the party, but I have to. Well, we're used to you being the skunk at the party sometimes, so that's okay. We're gonna count on that. Um, the, no, you're, you're bringing up exactly what I was next gonna ask you. We all know that we've had a big hit to state revenues. And my understanding is every department is being asked to look at um, something like a 10% budget cut for next year. So we know there are going to be financial pressures. And my question to you is, do you need an appropriation to stand up an alternative program for trail management in the state of Vermont? Thanks. We Yes, in a word. But I want to be clear. That was true before the coronavirus uh, arrived. That was true and part of this conversation all along which was, well, we'll get to that. And everyone seems to recognize that, but that was, it's only made more challenging now. That said, this is something our staff have heard me say. I believe that FPR is uniquely positioned to be um, disproportionately helpful in both a response and a recovery to this crisis, both in terms of human health, community wellness, and economic recovery. And I believe a robust, 
uh, modern approach to trail building, trail design, trail use and maintenance is part of that. And it's actually, we need this to make full on the promise of being a positive part of the recovery and response to this crisis. And I actually think that this policy point before you right now is actually relevant, germane, and timely in that sense. Okay. Um, Senator McDonald, you had asked a question about 20 minutes ago. Um, are we getting any closer to an answer to your question? Um, I, I was hoping someone would address what's being proposed. And okay. so far we've heard, um, we've, what we've heard is was longer than the Gettysburg address, but I don't <laughs> know what is being proposed. Okay, well, that's a perfect segue if, if we don't have any more questions for Commissioner Snyder at the moment, and I don't see any, um, then to move I on. I could give a, sh you know, I could get, I need to respond. I mean, I, I could give a shorter uh, answer, but I was asked a question. 86 words. It's several years, okay? and it's serious, and people have worked hard and spent money on this. And so, but the answer is, if you want the short one is, you have trails language in 926. We agree with it. We're good with it. Pass it out. That's the answer to, to pr provide us a, a temporary interim solution to issues that have been plaguing folks for years and give time for these groups to continue and finish this good work so that we're done. That's the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. And that was probably closer to 86 words. So there we go. Um, and so Mr. Fidel, would you like to take it away and talk more about your work on this topic? Sure. Thanks. Good morning to y'all. Good to see you all. I'm uh, Jamie Fidel. I'm the General Counsel and Forest and Wildlife Program Director at Vermont Natural Resources Council. And as Commissioner Snyder mentioned, been working to represent a coalition of groups that um, the Vermont Land Trust, uh, the Vermont chapter of the Nature Conservancy, a Trust for Public Land, Audubon Vermont, Vermont Natural Resources Council, um, under the Forest Partnership to work on this issue. And I'd just like to, to say that we're, we're looking at this not only from the perspective of how to build that world-class system we've been talking about for trail recreation with um, some environmental sensitivities in mind, but also our groups actually um, many of them actually host trails on their properties and are part of the trail development community and part of the Vermont Trails and Greenways Council, in addition to being land trusts and conservation organizations. So we've come at it with a, a fairly broad perspective. We've been participating in this conversation to try and be as productive as possible um, and address some of the challenges that, that are out there. As um, Commissioner Snyder mentioned, this is been sort of a longstanding issue, both from a policy perspective in the state, but also it's been part of the Act 250 Commission's work with various charges to um, Commissioner Snyder and others to report back. And then there's been this effort that Mike has alluded to among the Forest Partnership and the Vermont Trails Alliance in particular, where we kind of rolled up our sleeves and been trying to tackle um, not only developing the interim policies that we think could be helpful now as part of uh, Act 250 bill consideration, um, but also to realize that there, there could be a different way to do this that would be uh, a win-win, that would really allow for the promotion and development of trails, um, but also do it in a way that maybe strips away some of the complexity um, that Ellen was going through before with the different types of uh, options and try and figure out a, a, a a simple but effective way uh, to look at how to promote trail development with environmental considerations in mind. You know, part of this conversation started a couple of years ago when, when there were efforts, um, the trail groups were interested in seeking some clarification on issues. And, and part of that has to do with some of the issues that are in the JOs, which Senator Bray, you referenced are on the webpage. Mm -hmm. And some of those issues relate to um, trails have been built on the ground and then new segments are being built and sometime they, they, sometimes they connect as part of a larger network and there's been an outstanding question at what point do those comprehensively trigger uh, Act 250 and that's been a tricky issue um, and that was one of the issues where um, there were some efforts years ago to clarify that which would have 
uh, in our opinion, really limited the scope or application of Act 250. And so we started a conversation with the trail groups to say, if that's the interest, let's talk about what is the alternative then, because it's not really a durable policy to just sort of move the bulk of trail development outside of environmental review um, without having some kind of effective alternative. And through our conversations with the VTA, we were able to come up with a number of shared principles where we agreed we can develop this alternative program and do it to address both the environmental considerations and to address the challenges that the trail groups have had, recognizing that a lot of it is volunteer capacity. Um, so Warren and I, as we've been presenting our work have been tag teaming. So if it's all right with you, we thought we could bounce back and forth and share different parts of, of this outline with you. Um, and I just wanted to give a little bit of the history of our groups um, coming together and um, allow Warren to share kind of the bulk of what is this alternative program look like. Um, and then I could come back and talk about some of the remaining issues that we're working on, um, including that funding issue, which is really important. And then I, we would both be available to answer any questions you have about the work that we've been doing. Great. Well, uh, that uh, of work course for you the, answer is, the answer is yes, we're happy to have witnesses use the time, however they think it's going to be productive. So if you want to tag team, that, that would be... Uh, I, I'm helpful, I'm sure. Um, I have a quick question before Warren uh, picks it back up, and that is, um, is there a clearer sense one way or the other that Act 250 is just not well suited to trails management and therefore we need an alternative, or is it, is it the difficulty in remodeling Act 250 to accommodate trails, or is it, was it in some way, you might even say, inappropriate that we ever tried to use Act 250 to regulate trails? Well, that's a good question. I think you'd get different answers from, from different people. Um, I think that we've acknowledged that there's some complexity in applying Act 250 to kind of the, the linear model of trail development, where instead of looking at, you know, if you need to add up overall disturbance, you're looking at a confined trail and then, you know, going out a certain distance in order to trigger review. Um, having said that, I've listened to um, I've listened to NRB presentations where it does seem like the bulk of trails do receive permits. Um, so I don't think it's been that Act 250 has um, been a hindrance to trail development, but there are challenges and there's costs and there's I'll let the trail groups speak for themselves about what they have seen as some of the challenges. So um, I think that. I think that you know, in order to look at it objectively, that it, it has it has functioned to a certain degree, but we've also spent a lot of time talking about what some of the challenges are. And I think in the end, we just decided that perhaps there is a different model um, that a lot of the trail development in Vermont is not going through Act 250. So is that the right approach, um, or is that uh, uh, is that a shortcoming? I'm sure different people would have different perspectives on that. But in our opinion, if we could step back and actually look at a different model that allows for really proactive trail development that has the environmental considerations in mind, but is, is, is efficient for the trail groups um, and is based on a process that cites trails in the right locations and is sensitive to not having trails in locations that could have a lot of impacts and that we can develop a system that works for everybody that we're willing to to do that, um, so okay, I so hope Senator, that provides a little bit of insight there. Senator McDonald. Mr. Chair, I'm very grateful that we have spent the time a couple of years to step back and take a look at the new model that's supposed to tackle this problem. Would someone share with this committee that model and how it works? Um, I perhaps Warren Coleman has been suggested will share that with us, but we passed the ball from four different people and we, some, I'm waiting to be lobbied on the proposal. <laughs> we all are. All right. Well, uh, Senator McDonald, you're the master of the segue. With that, let's go to Warren Coleman. 
Thank you, Senator McDonald. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, I've been working with a group called the Vermont Trail Alliance for about a year and a half. And just so you have an idea, it's a, it's a pretty broad cross section of the trail organizations in the state, including motorized and non motorized activities. So things like VAST and VASA, Vermont Mountain Bike Association, um, Green Mountain Club, uh, the Catamount Trail, the HUD system across Vermont Trail. So hiking, biking, um, and, uh, and motorized sports. And, and uh, obviously very different types of uh, trail usage, but, but a common interest uh, that I think we share in trying to come up with a, a, uh, a, a different system that is easy for everyone to understand, easy for everyone to use, whether you're a, a larger, more sophisticated organization like VAST or whether you're a small trail organization that's working in a local community. Don't forget a couple things about this that I need to emphasize. One is that the vast majority of all these trail networks are built uh, uh, and cited because of the generosity of private landowners. So we also need to understand that what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're respectful of, 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 of their generosity and that the trail organizations have the the uh, obligation or responsibility to do things the right way. And they, and they, and they to date, they largely have done that. And that's why we have such a great trail network. Um, so you need to, uh, need to make sure you keep that, uh, keep that in mind. We want to have something that's understandable and, and predictable for everybody. So to get to your question, um, uh, and I shared this document earlier with Senator Bray. I know Jamie had sent it probably earlier. Uh, I know you probably haven't seen it or had time to look at it so you can, uh, do that in your in your uh, in your downtime. But we developed a, we developed a, a working concept proposal that we shared with the House Natural Resources Committee. Um, and so I'm going to just walk you through the, the highlights of it. The goal is to just give you a sense of what we've agreed on and what the what the alternative program sort of outline looks like. Acknowledging that, as Mike said earlier, we've got some more work to do to sort of bring it uh, bring it home. The legislation, just so you know, has a report back of December to you, to your committee, the House Natural Resources Committee, to say, Senators, uh, Representatives, this is the this is the program that we're recommending to you. Here are the statutory changes we uh, we would need to stand up this program. Here's the funding we would need to stand up this program. I should also mention, while our groups, the VTA and and Force Partnership, have been working very closely together also with, with ANR. There's a number of other stakeholders who need to be brought into this discussion as we, as we advance this and hopefully bring you something in December that, that puts this all together. We've got a lot of land trust organizations. We've got recreational user groups. Um, there's a lot of folks that either host trails uh, or use trails um, and, uh, and we need to make sure that they're, they're on board. So with that, with that as background, um, I'm going to sort of touch on a number of sort of shared overarching principles, and then I'm going to get into the specifics of the of some of the elements of what this alternative looks like. So we've sort of recognized that obviously trails are an important part of the Vermont economy. It's important to provide access to outdoor use. It's important for purposes of transportation. Um, we need, as I said earlier, we need an efficient, consistent process for oversight of trails. Uh, and recognizes the generosity of private landowners to use that. Um, something that's easy for everyone to understand. Something that is more in the spirit of uh, providing education from a &R, technical assistance uh, and support resources for trail organizations. Um, the other thing, and I think Mike Snyder mentioned this, this is really gonna be a best management practices driven program. So all the different trail networks currently have best management practices that they use to build, site, and maintain their trail networks. So we need to sort of formalize those, those best management practices. And I think as Commissioner Snyder said, also add to those best management practices certain elements um, that are currently part of Act 250, or, or maybe some of them quite frankly aren't, but deal with things like make sure we're dealing with traffic, make sure, um, make sure we're, uh, addressing and minimizing any uh, impacts to, uh, to wildlife or natural resources. Um, I should also mention, and Ellen touched on this, that, that currently when somebody's building a trail, if they trigger the need for an ANR permit, like a stream crossing permit, 
they, they have to go get it. And that, that, that currently exists. And that's not something that would change that if you need, if you trigger the threshold for an ANR permit, you got to get it now, you'd still have to get it in the future. Um, so the program would basically be a, a best management driven um, uh, program. It would be built upon, we have, if you look at title, uh, if you look at title 10, chapter 20, back going back to now, got a program that, that established the importance of creating a Vermont trail system uh, network and gave FPR um, sort of the oversight of that, uh, you know, of that program. But what we're trying to do at the broadest level is enhance what it means to be part of the Vermont trail system network by encouraging proper development, operation and maintenance of those trail networks. Second, make sure that we've got the technical assistance, the ability for consultation and environmental review, um, uh, before we go out and build new trails, make sure we build and maintain those trails according to best management practices and minimize impacts. Uh, and then third, and this couldn't be more important uh, today than, than ever, uh, is we need, to, we need to recognize the economic value of the Vermont, Vermont trail system and really all trails where they're located. So here's sort of the alternative program just outline and let me just say at the outset what we've what we've conceived so far is basically a tiered program that basically has to do with sort of scale size and scale of impact so we'll i'll be talking about sort of a tier one a tier two and a tier three but what i'm going to touch on right now are principles that are overarching and cover all of all of those regardless of where of, of where you're at so First one, we've been talking about this. Uh, Warren, sorry to interrupt just a second for, for the committee. So um, I just sent on Warren's email with the outline to Jude. She's distributing it to everyone in the committee. So uh, just so that, that, that everyone will have that document. There's a lot of words. I'm not going to read the document, but I'm just going to yep. try and touch on, the, touch on the highlights. If you have a question, shoot. It sounds like we'll, we'll be coming back to this at some point. Yep. So, the alternative program would provide you relief. You would be you would be exempt from Act 250, provided that you're covered by this by this new program. Um, basically, new trails would be developed and maintained to be built and maintained according to these agreed upon best management practices. Um, the program would not would not impose any regulatory burdens on landowners who are making their lands available for the for the trails. The responsibility is solely is solely for the um, uh, the trail the trail groups. Um, that normally go with trails also wouldn't be part of Act 250, but things that trigger Act 250 on their own. If somebody's building a large parking lot or, or something, something else would, would, uh, wouldn't be exempt um, that we'd create and, and build upon uh, the Vermont trail system process. And this goes back to what Commissioner Snyder was, uh, uh, was, was talking about. Something that, uh, something that takes the concept from 1993 and elevates the status of what it means to be part of the Vermont trail system Maybe that could give you access to funding in the future. Maybe it helps you promote the trail networks. It helps promotes the, the trail network on a, on a state level. Um, I mentioned this already, <clears throat> that we would be adding to the best management practices a uh, uh, basically a list of different resources that we would want to make sure that we're, we're taking into account when we're citing, uh, uh, we're citing our trails. You'd have to get and obtain any ANR local permits that you currently need. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the A <coughs> excuse me. The ANR would have the authority to uh, <coughs> conduct audits to verify that people are doing what they purport to be doing in terms of um, building according to best management practices. <coughs> um, that that non-compliance with BMPs. Uh, would would be dealt with also so that that a and r be able to audit and make sure that that if there are deficiencies that people are making improvements uh, if a section of trail needs to be closed for one reason or another because an improvement can't be made to it or it's no longer an appropriate segment that that, that could be something um, we would build in basically an annual meeting process for all the vermont trail system trails with a and r 
to, to, to review activities, to look at proposed activity trails. <clears throat> We've heard from a &R that making sure that there is a planning component uh, to this. I've heard this also from, uh, from um, Ms. Snelling that uh, understanding what the roadmap is for where we're going with trails, trying to maximize where we're, we're building trail networks that are complementary to each other, that they're multi-use and they can with as much, much foresight as possible um, is important. That's something we're, we're committed to doing. Um, that we update the maps for the Vermont Trail System trails and do that on an annual basis. And they, we also update and review the best management practices that we ultimately that we ultimately use. So those are sort of the overarching principles that apply to any of the different types of uh, trails, trail networks, or regardless of what kind of category you fall into. So those are the, those are the overarching ones. Um, I'll quickly just touch on, on sort of the different the different categories, and then I'm going to turn it back over to to Jamie. Um, We'd have what we call a tier one, which would be sort of a de minimis category for activities that are things like routine maintenance and repair of an existing trail. If something gets uh, washed out or if there's trees that are blown down or something that you need to go out and do the work, you go out and you do the work. Um, uh, if it's something that uses existing state or town roads, if it's upgrades to a trail, practices, if it's relocations of a trail because you've got a beaver pond that now makes it, uh, uh, creates an impediment or you've got other things that happen that that's, you've got a farmer who's been allowing to you to use the edge of a cornfield and they want to shift where they're growing things. So you need to make an adjustment of where your trail is. Those are the types of things that, that we think would fall into this category where, where people understand what the BMPs are and you go out and you do the work. Uh, the next category, which is this tier two category, really involves uh, a notification process to agency and natural resources and a consultation process with them as uh, we haven't settled on the exact sort of uh, magnitude of what would fall into this uh, fall into this category. It's one of the things that we're still trying to uh, uh, trying to work out. But basically, we would have a um, a project, uh, basically a project sheet that has all the details about the uh, all of those details that we would submit to A&R, including the fact that you're, you're gonna be able to build to the best management practices, that you've done the review uh, to make sure you're not gonna have any uh, undue impact on, on environmental or natural resources uh, and, and have as necessary a consultation process with the agency and natural resources who will take a look at those, uh, take a look at those notifications. Uh, and again, this is one of the areas that we're working on with ANR is how much or how little review are they going to need to do? And I think it will, I think it will vary depending on the complexity of the project, uh, de depending on the location and, and, uh, and so forth. Um, and really then the last, um, the last category is, is that would, would involve sort of where we're currently at with Act 250, which is projects that involve 10 acres or more of, uh, of disturbance. And one of the things that we're, it's, this would still be a BMP driven project, but I think we all recognize that this may be a project that's of a size and scope that requires a more in-depth review, more public input uh, and notice. And one of the things we're trying to discuss and figure out, is this something that would be part of the FP process or is this something you would leave with, uh, leave with Act, 2, Act 250? Um, so those are at the very broadest strokes, sort of the three categories, this de minimis, which is maintenance, very small projects, the bulk of projects, which would be in this notice category to, uh, to ANR with a consultation process as it's, uh, as it's needed. And then this, uh, and then this major category, but they're all best management practice uh, based. And quite frankly, that's where a lot of us are trying to now turn our attention to is is taking the existing BMPs we have uh, and building upon them to make sure that we cover the issues that we know we need to cover in order to convince you and the public and recreational users 
um, that this alternative program is going to provide a level of sort of oversight uh, and direction to make sure that we've got a great uh, a great trail system. It in a nutshell. Okay, great. Thanks for the intro. Um, that's helpful. Um, so, Jamie, do you want to pick it back up? And there's something more you want to be adding? May I just ask yeah, I'll just touch on some of the issues that we're working through right now and just to kind of, you know, underscore. Um, sorry, can you hold for a second? I think Senator Campion had a question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Warren, are you, are, are you working with Jamie on this? Yeah, we've been working with Jamie, Jamie okay. and the Forest Partnership Group for almost two years on this. So that's, that's who you're representing. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the so the document when you see it, Brian, is yep. is a document. It's a joint. It's a joint proposal from the trail groups as well as the forest partnership groups, which is the environmental groups and a lot of the land trust organizations, which are also host trails. So this is a joint document we've put together. Terrific. Thank. You. Uh, so back to you, Jamie. Okay. Thanks. So. You know, just before I get into these issues that we're still trying to work out, you know, what I think um, hopefully you heard from more and wh where we have agreement is that we, um, you know, this is BMP driven. Um, there's a technical assistance component to this. It's it's not a it's not a voluntary program. There is some built in oversight that would happen from from the agency to ensure compliance with the BMPs. As Warren hit on, there would be a mechanism to address problems if the BMPs are not being followed, whether that's trying to rectify on the ground damage or um, if need be, go into enforcement mode. So there's an oversight component, but the bulk of this is driven based on BMP driven process with the different tiers and an opportunity for the agency to really do technical assistance. Um, so some of the group's volunteer capacity may not be able to actually know whether they're in some of the sensitive resources that may be part of the BMPs to avoid or minimize impacts to the agency would be available. And this gets into the, the funding and staffing that's needed is we would, in our, our, the vision of this would be that there would be people like a county forester, if you will, to Commissioner Snyder's analogy to current use that would be available to actually potentially, if need be, go on the ground and help the groups understand, are you impacting this resource or not? Uh, and to really be a resource so that the, the BMPs and whatever the environmental considerations are in those BMPs can actually be, be implemented on the ground. So there's a real real value there in that element of this, this program. Um, which kind of leads us to some technical questions as, we, as we're looking at then how to finalize what would be our recommendations to the agency and to you all as legislators as far as whether to implement this program. And that's clearly we need to figure out how do you define the triggers for each of these tiers, um, how to handle um, new trail development on land that is already under Act 250 review, or how would you handle amendments? Um, so we don't want to wipe out the history of what Act 250 has done as far as permit considerations go on lands, but we do need to figure out what do we do about the new trail development on, on those lands and amendments. Um, what about trails that are not part of the Vermont trail system? So the Vermont trail system is, um, is a known entity. And um, so I'm just gonna flip on my light here as my other one just crashed. So um, there's a bulk of trails that are under the Vermont trail system. And then there are trails that are not. And we need to figure out, are we talking about all trails, let's say that are open for public use? Are we just talking about those trails as part of the Vermont trail system? That may be confusing if there are certain trails that are then part of this program and those that aren't. So we, we need to address that. Um, Again, as Warren mentioned, how do we determine the exact role of the agency? Um, what's their capacity? What are they doing in these individual tiers? How are we involving the public input uh, that may be required in that higher tier, which is for um, the larger developments? Um, how do you determine jurisdiction for commercial aspects of trail, trail projects? For example, retail buildings that are associated 
you know, with it, you know, our intent is not necessarily to have what would be legitimate activities that would normally be covered under Act 250 somehow have a loophole because they're associated with this trail development that would be under another program. But we have to really fine tune that because that issue will probably come up. And then kind of the really big issue clearly is, is how do we fund this? We acknowledge this program. It, um, we can't ask the agency to do this without resources. What would be the resources that are needed um, to do this effectively? And clearly, um, we're not operating in a vacuum here. We understand that the challenge on how to fund this program has only gotten significantly harder in recent time. And so I think that's coloring right now, um, you know, both our need to figure out um, both the viability of continuing to do this work. Our hope certainly would be that we don't wanna lose the momentum of what we've been working on for two years. We feel we've got a really good faith effort going here. We'd like to try and continue it and present it to you clearly we know it have to be funded. And so that's a big, big concern. And I would say that some of the interim policies that we've uh, agreed on, and I'll just speak from the forest partnerships perspective, um, we're meant to try and relieve the pressure right now so that all of us can continue focusing on building is the right solution overall. Some of those interim policies that are in 926 weren't necessarily intended to be durable long-term policies. And so if the alternative review program can't be funded, then it's gonna, it's gonna create a challenge because again, some of, those so, some of those provisions will sunset. Um, and it's, it was our intention not to have them then become permanent. Um, and so we'd really like your assistance as, as the legislators to understand how we can be successful in presenting this package to you and also having it funded. Okay. Um, I have a quick question on BMPs. Are they pretty well agreed upon? I know that from past conversations inside and out of committee that different organizations have put together their own BMPs as they've managed their own systems. Um, so I'm just wondering if, it, if it's going to become one coherent program, do you have to come up with a, a standardized set of BMPs? Um, and if so, how close to having agreed upon standards is this working group? I'll take a, I can take a first crack at that. So right now, all the trail networks, uh, all the Vermont Trail System trails do have BMPs. Some of them are based on US Forest Service BMPs. Some of them are based on uh, sort of a national mountain biking set of BMPs. So, so everyone has a set um, and what's appropriate for mountain biking, uh, you know, each trail, each trail user group, um, you know, to some degree their BMPs are, are, are different uh, because, of the, because of the nature of the, of, of the use and the type of trail you design. You design a different trail for, for mountain biking than you do for, uh, for hiking. Um, that being said, what we're trying to do is, and, and Commissioner Snyder is very familiar with, with these BMPs, you know, the BMPs for the different types of trail networks. So we, we still envision that each type of trail will have a set of BMPs that is germane to their, their level of usage. What I think we're talking about is now developing something that's a, an addition to that, um, that's sort of an overlay uh, that looks at some of those other resource issues to make sure that uh, to make sure that parking and waste uh, and wildlife issues and all of those other things um, that are not you know when, I, when we talk about the BMPs that are in place today most of them are more about you know um, how do you how do you prevent erosion basically it's they're, they're more sort of construction uh, guidelines and, and, and uh, rules and so um, those are those are important. They'll always be important. So we're trying to find sort of a, a, a an across the board set of BMPs that we would add as an overlay to make sure these other issues are covered. So whether it's a hiking trail or a biking trail or an ATV trail, we know we need to deal with parking. We know we need to deal with waste. Those sort the those sorts of issues. So, but we also realize this is something that that uh, we need stakeholder input on uh, so that everyone since this whole program is going to be based on those best management practices, at some level, these BMPs will have to be uh, re reviewed, approved, and, and um, 
uh, and formalized because people are gonna rely on those and be held accountable to, to use those. Okay. Um, and so the nine, no, even though we're not really talking about 926, it is in the background, right? So the proposal, the amendment that Representative Dolan offered before third reading, I guess, on 926 that had some trails language, yep. was that language that uh, you and Mr. Fidel had agreed to and brought to the committee? Is that sort of an interim proposal from this working group? The, the language is, reflects the agreement, not only of, of the Vermont Trail Alliance and Forest Partnership, but also the, uh, the administration. We worked, we worked together on that. In fact, ultimately um, it was uh, Matt Chapman, who's general counsel for a &R, who you who you know well, helped uh, as well as Greg Bobel, helped us with uh, uh, fine, -tuning, uh, fine tuning that language. So, so it's, a, it, it's, a joint, it's a joint proposal. It does not, if you've read it, it really is dealing with clarifying a number of current Act 250 provisions to, to help us with, with this sort of interim period, then a directive to our groups to say, go finish your work. You're, we know you're almost there, but go finish it. And here's the time frame. All this clarity that we're providing you right now goes away January 1st, 20, 2022. So go do your work. Here's some certainty. Come back to us with a proposal. And hopefully we can stand up that new program and and sunset these other provisions. That's that's the crux of what's in uh, in that bill. The stuff that I went through about the tier one, two, and three, none of that is in there. And we didn't ask them to get into the weeds, nor are we asking you. We just wanted to give you a sense of the work we've done uh, and and what we've got uh, what we've got left to do. So that's really sort of the directive to FPR and and the rest of us to go finish go finish our work. Okay. Um, any committee questions for Mr. Coleman or Mr. Fidel? All right, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I think then I'd like to move on and hear from Natural Resources Board. Uh, Senator McDonald, before we go. Um, um, I want to um, thank the last witness for giving us some meat to look at and uh, I'm in the best sense of the word. And uh, I want to thank Jude for E emailing me again the the tears language that I was able to go through. Um, I we've talked often the word that has been used about is world class trail systems, and um, as someone who's walked dirt trails, up Campbell's Hump and other places, and understands the urge and that perhaps wisdom in using old railroad beds. Um, I don't know what a world tra class trail system is and I'm wary. So I'm waiting to listen to more um, further presentations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, so maybe uh, I'll take a stab at it and then I ask Commissioner Snyder to offer a definition to world class because I think he was the one who brought that phrase to us today. I, I've thought of it as meaning that we have um, such a great collection of trails that people from all over the country or the world would come here to use the facilities, you know, that kind of a thing. Like they'd be a great attraction. Mr. Commissioner Snyder, do you want to say something about yeah. world what world class means to you when you talk about it? Sure. Uh, it, it means that, that it, in my mind, it's a vision for a statewide system of trails that includes a variety of types, scales, uses, purposes, locations, but that they're all built to as best in class. And they're all um, industry standard for best practices, uh, for design, layout, construction, use, and maintenance. Um, and that they are, they're just thoughtful and they're appropriate for where they are and what they're used for. And that they are, as you said, uh, Mr. Chair, that they are enjoyed by a, a variety and diversity of people from all over. Um, that there's something to be proud of. They are of, they are of exceptionally high quality and that, that is um, appropriate for purpose and location use. Great. 
Um, so thank you for that. Let's uh, pivot to um, Chair Snelling and Mr. Bilbo to talk to us about the, the NRB uh, perspective on trails, regulations, development, all the rest. Good to see you this morning. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Diane Snelling, uh, Chair of the Natural Resources Board. Um, first and foremost, I want to apologize for multitasking at the beginning of this meeting and including whatever it is I was trying to resolve by doing two meetings at once. So I do apologize you. for that. Um, no apology, no. <laughs> well, this is an unusual time, let me say that. Um, I also wanted to just thank the commissioner and um, uh, uh, Warren and Jamie for all the work they put into this and, and obviously to Greg Bobel and um, Evan Mean in, at the Natural Resources Board. Um, you know, it's been a, a long and somewhat difficult process. And so I am definitely um, in league with the commissioner and um, the stakeholders in saying that it would be a good idea to keep going on this to get to a better uh, final place than we are at at the, at the moment. So going forward with this uh, particular presentation, if that's possible, um, and let the groups keep working on things. But trails have always been important to Vermont. Um, you know, I, I, I agree on the definition of world class and I, I think thoughtful to me is one of the things that stuck out in what you said, Commissioner, because what's most important to me is that whatever trail system, uh, recreational uh, opportunities we have are sustainable and built on good stewardship standards. And I think everybody said that, so I'm not saying anything new, um, but I do think that's the goal. And um, I do think there needs to be some boundaries um, uh, pun included, I guess, um, around how uh, trails get developed to the extent that um, there is some amount of regulation required for trail building, not necessarily Act 250. Um, I do want to say for the record that I, that I think a lot of the perceived problems with Act 250 are just that, perceived as opposed to real, which is not to say we couldn't make improvements were we to have to in how Act 250 um, reviews trails. So uh, one of the specific things I think that I had been asked to speak about was jurisdictional opinions. And I see that mostly in relationship to Vermont, um, to the Kingdom Trails and to the um, uh, Hills, uh, what is it? Um, what's the other one, the big uh, trail? Victory. Victory. Victory Hills. Victory Hills trails. Right. I, and, and I say this because um, it's important to remember that jurisdictional opinions, um, anyone can ask for one and accept within NRB, obviously, anybody, any individual citizen can ask for a jurisdictional opinion. And that goes to the coordinator in each district. And it is their sole discretion to, to issue that jurisdictional opinion. Um, there's no influence that the commission can bring on it. There's no influence that I can bring on it. Um, and Greg, please correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> anywhere along here. Um, but I do think that's some of the misperception, if you will, about Act 250 is trying to understand what it actually is and then make modifications that do improve it. Um, and, I, and I know that that's been part of the ongoing conversation and I, and I know it will continue to be. So I appreciate that. Can uh, I just a quick beginner question on JO? Sure. So, uh, so anyone, do they have to be a Vermont resident to ask for a JO? I, I would think so, but Greg, I don't know. Yeah, um, just for the record, Greg Bobo, Natural Resources Board General Counsel. Thanks very much for having us today. Um, the, the statute that uh, controls jurisdictional opinions and our rule does not require on its face that, um, that the requester must be uh, a resident. In fact, the, the language is rather broad and it indicates that anyone can request a jurisdictional opinion. Um, there's been case law developed since the advent of Act 250 
that reminds us, and I think the chair already mentioned this, that um, that excludes anyone, any person excludes any person from the Natural Resources Board itself. So other, other than that limitation, there's, there's not a great deal of limitation with respect to who may request a jurisdictional opinion. Okay, and then the district commission, do they, if so requested, do they have to issue one or they, can they decline to do so? That's my whole point is it goes, the jurisdictional opinion is from the coordinator and totally at the coordinator's determination. The commission doesn't engage in that issue. Okay. So what they do when they receive a request for a jurisdictional opinion is research um, all the aspects that would be required. You know, is there a permit? Are there, have there been amendments to any of parts of the trail that might be development? Um, you know, all aspects of what could constitute commercial, um, et cetera. And then the, the opinion is issued. Um, and there is no time requirement between the request and the issuance of a jurisdictional opinion. Um, it, it, jurisdictional opinions can be appealed. And I believe we are currently in that situation um, on, I think at least Kingdom Trails um, and also probably on Victory Hills um, where there's an ongoing court action to say that the determination of jurisdiction is, um, is incorrect. Okay, uh, they go so, to the Environmental Division of Superior Court. Is that where they land? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have a couple questions too, as long as we're on JOs. Uh, sure, I don't know if, uh, Chair Snelling, if you want to say a little more about them generally before we go to Senator Rogers' question or- Kind of covers it. <laughs> okay, there we go, Senator Rogers. Well, um, first off, I, I am a little disturbed that anybody from anywhere can file a JO uh, because we believe the ones in the kingdom were done to harass. One of the guys that filed a JO is a, a known violator of state laws and has cut ski trails on um, state land. So um, that is part of, of what's not, what needs to be dealt with for the two systems in the kingdom that is not in the Act 250 bill um, presently. And so, uh, Senator, if I may, I, I just need to understand you're saying that you think there should be a limit on who can ask. Well, I'm just I'm saying that you can really tie um, an organization up when a J.O. is used for harassment and having it be open to anybody seems like it could be problematic. Okay. My point to you, though, would be respectfully that there's no harassment in asking for a jurisdictional opinion because that oh, the only thing that triggers is the research into and an issuance of that opinion. So unless, unless you know, I mean, I hear what you're saying that, that people ask for one knowing that it might take some time and therefore they're kind of intervening. Um, but the way it works is somebody can ask for a jurisdictional opinion and it happens all the time on many issues. And um, the coordinators uh, are very diligent in trying, you know, to have a very clear logic in, in their, um, in, as to whether it is jurisdictional or not. And um, so, uh, you know, I guess, Eventually, yes, you might want to have some changes to that or to other aspects of how that's determined, but that is the current process. Right. You know, to that point, I think, you know, sometimes when people in state house conversations about it, when people were surprised that anyone could ask for a JO, they thought, I mean, I think they've had the impression a little bit that it, by asking, you've pulled someone into a formal Act 250 um, jurisdiction, as opposed to asking whether or not they always should have been subject to Act 250 jurisdiction. Is that the distinction you're? Yeah, I, I do. I really think there's a lot of um, miscommunication, misunderstanding of, of what the process is. It, it, just, it just triggers a review. 
Is there jurisdiction right, but it or not? Doesn't, doesn't it also, I mean, wouldn't it require somebody to spend a huge amount of money and time on lawyers and whatnot to, to disprove the J.O.? I mean, it's not like it's not without re consequences to the folks, even if in the long run, the, the decision is they shouldn't have been under Act 250. They still, on their own property and, and with their own money, get tied up in a big to-do. Okay, so the big to-do to me and the distinction on these two trails is that they were both determined to be commercial. And I think that's, that's the element here that's different from a lot of other trails, is when something's commercial, and then you can argue, is it really or not? And I don't, I don't have that answer, but, but that was contained in uh, and will be contained in the jurisdictional opinions. Um, but it doesn't involve or gauge anybody more than their um, understanding they need to get a permit. Now, I think in the situations up in your area that it seemed to me that nobody ever asked you know, certainly with Victory Hills, they didn't say, well, what would we have to do to get a permit? They just said, we're not even going to try. And that was very distressing because it came across to a lot of people that somehow Act 250 had put something on them. We didn't put anything on them. But they could have easily said, well, what would it take to get a permit? Mm -hmm. And it might have been, it might be still a lot easier than they think it might be. I mean, I see the whole, all the, the area, the whole um, community being very supportive of both of those trails. So would you get, um, you know, uh, opposition to the trails? I, you know, to me, that seems unlikely. Um, the other issues would be, do they need to take better protection of wetlands that might be in those areas that weren't uh, revealed because there was no review? would they maybe have to do some uh, upgrades with parking? I mean, I don't think any of the things that would make them be ready to get an Act 250 permit are, um, you know, extraordinary burdens. Right, but most people don't want Act 250 jurisdiction on their land. And that is the fear that if these JOs start happening on trail systems around the state, that everybody is gonna pull their land out of the trail system, which will devastate it. And we talk about commercial. Well, and I don't know where you draw the line at commercial, but it does cost money to build and maintain trails. So of course people would be expected to contribute. Do we call vast commercial? People have to pay for their trail passes and, and all that, but I don't think we call vast commercial. So I don't know where the line is, but I do know that everybody is going to pull their land out of whatever trail they're part of if Act 250 starts taking uh, effect over their land. So let me respond to that if I may, Senator, because I have heard that argument and I, and I have a lot of sympathy with it, which is that, um, especially with Kingdom Trails, I guess, that there's some concern if people think there's going to be Act 250 jurisdiction, they will pull their land. And some people pulled their land already for different reasons. Mm -hmm. right for overuse and conflicts and whatever but um i think one of the issues that should make a big difference is first of all that's not the way it works the jurisdiction is only over the the width of the trail but no matter how many times i've tried to explain this to people they really it's it's a unsubstantiated fear i think about their land being taken over and so one of the things i've uh, been asking people would it make a difference if uh, there was the opportunity to have jurisdiction be lifted under some process? You know, in other words, once Act 250 jurisdiction is on the trail on their property, could that be lifted at some time in the future? And I think yeah. a lot of people would feel a lot more comfortable if they had that option. I think you're right. So I just feel like, let's get to it. These are both great trails. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to participate. Um, I would really hope that they, the, that the two trail systems, you know, one that's one property owner and the other that multiple property owners would understand there's no, it's not, um, 
it, it shouldn't be overwhelming to get a permit um, in the sense of cost or anything else. Um, are there occasions where you, you need to get A&R permits? You know, that you might need to get some A&R permits. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I think we would all agree that we want people to. Yeah. Well, I'm just afraid that the J.O. issues here in the kingdom are a canary in a coal mine because there are trail systems all over the state. These, you know, Kingdom Trails is probably the most well known. But so anybody who has an issue with a neighbor or somebody who has a trail system on their land could, could start making JOs all over the place. And I just, I think it's another portion of this that we really need to scrutinize. So I would recommend you focus on that issue of if people could go through a process to have that jurisdiction lifted, should they decide they don't wanna be part of the trail system anymore? you know, and the trail will now divert around their property or whatever, that that in and of itself, and I don't know, Jamie, um, you know, commissioner, I, I, do, do you think that that has a, would have a big impact if people knew that there was a way to release jurisdiction if it no longer applied? I, I mean, I'll just chime in. I mean, uh, having trails across landowner property is probably the most critical issue that for uh, and for the trail organizations, uh, if you start having individuals pull their pull their property out of that network, trying to reconnect that network is, you know, that's. I'm not saying uh, that's 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 the issue. I don't want people to pull their property. I'm just saying, would it give property owners who are concerned that somehow this means Act 250 has some finger in their pie? You know, would it? give them reassurance so that they would stay in the, the, the um, organizations to have the trails. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying that's what I, people have told me that would make a difference. I, I think what this points to is that whether the, whether the, the fear is real or perceived, uh, finding a different way to do this, the way that we're describing is really what we've tried to been, been focusing on, right? We haven't been focusing on all the confusion that it creates uh, for those of us that eat, sleep, and breathe Act 250, you know that it, it, it's one thing. For those of us that, that don't, and the you know these are mostly maintained by volunteers. Most of these are nonprofit organizations. Um, they don't want to be hiring attorneys to help them through the JO process. I mean, that's a lot of them don't have the capacity to do that. They're not as large as a Kingdom Trail or Victory Hill. A lot of these are much smaller. Uh, uh, trail networks completely volunteer, and so that's that's at least what this provision was trying to do. That, that Senator Rogers was 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 explaining was to put a time out on that. So there's there's not that there's not that that fear out there that that's going to happen, and let us focus on standing up the new program and getting everybody. I, I agree. I, I wasn't course. trying to say. I, I guess I was just trying to clarify something, and I apologize if it somehow overlapped between the recommendation to keep working on things, which obviously I agree with, um, and whatever might in the interim provide people some more uh, reassurance. And I do think right or wrong, people associate Act 250 with things um, that they feel um, uh, conflict. And um, that is one of the best advantages of a new system, just that it doesn't, it's not called Act 250. <laughs> Act 251. Okay. Um, so the I have a quick question. I'm looking back at my page one notes here on terms of how much of a property comes under Act 250 jurisdiction. And the note I wrote was um, on projects that are counted as to the Vermont Trail System ones uh, for the state or municipal uh, sort of public benefit. That it's the disturbed land only, but and if it's a commercial project, it's the entirety of the property. I wrote down all land, and then I have a little note underneath that. But see also Rule seventy one, which limits jurisdictional limits. So, can someone sort that one out for me? I, I think I can, uh, Senator Bray, if that's all right with you. Please. Sure. So yeah, it is a little bit, you've picked up on the nuance, which I think is great. Um, 
generally speaking, let's just talk about non non um, municipal purpose or state purpose or Vermont trail system purpose uh, trail. So just commercial trails. You're correct that the, um, the trigger for jurisdiction would be based on the size of the tract or tracks involved. In towns that have both permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, the threshold is 10 acres or more. In towns that do not have those types of bylaws, the threshold is one acre or more. And again, that's the size of the tract or tracks involved. That's the trigger for determining whether or not such a project would need to go through Act 250. But Rule 71 tells us that actual jurisdiction only goes to the width of the trail corridor. So once jurisdiction is established, jurisdiction only, only attaches to width, the width of the trail corridor. So if you have a 100 acre parcel or parcels combined, 250 jurisdiction would only extend to the 10 or eight or 12 foot uh, trail corridor uh, that passes through that 100 acre parcel. Right. Um, now, with respect to um, Vermont trail system trails that do uh, uh, um, enjoy the sort of higher threshold for jurisdiction for, for, for Act 250 triggers, uh, the question is, how much acreage does the trail system impact? And if the, if the answer to that question is 10 acres or more of disturbance, then Act 250 tr uh, jurisdiction would trigger. But again, pursuant to Rule 71, the only area of the parcels in question that would be jurisdictional is the trail corridor itself. So uh, with respect to both commercial trails and uh, municipal or state purpose trails slash VTS trails, the only jurisdictional area is the corridor of the trail itself. It's nuanced and a little complex, so I apologize, and I hope I did a good. Yeah, answer. no, that's it's helpful. I just want to make sure we got it straight. <laughs> My, I think what Chair Snelling was just saying is that limitation to just the track, uh, the width of the track being actually under Act Two Fifty uh, review, for instance, is like a, a either misunderstood or it's cold comfort to someone who then has 80 other acres, then they're volunteering their land for the trail because uh, somehow I think it either feels like a burden or that somehow one day they're going to, it will be burdensome if they want to do, uh, I don't know, build a new barn on the, the rest of their property. Right. Somehow it won't be, it won't be just their barn, they're building it their property, it will be an Act 250 review for it. Yeah, this is something that we've uh, historically, for one reason or another, had a very difficult time articulating to the public. Um, and I can tell you, I, I also happen to be a great enjoyer of trails, mountain biking, hiking, skiing, and so forth. And so I have a number of friends uh, in this industry, and, and I continually have a difficult time um, explaining or maybe even convincing um, people in the industry that this is how Act 250 jurisdiction works currently. Right. Um, so great. I, I'm looking at the clock. I'm mindful that the there's an all Senate meeting at noon. So I um, just want to start to wrap up um, in the next five minutes. Uh, is there anyone who had something they wanted to share with the committee today that uh, feel like we've passed by a point that you wanted to make with us? All right. If I if, if I could make a very quick clarification, um, Senator, yes, um, I, there was some discussion of the two trail systems that are currently going through the jurisdictional opinion process, and I just wanted to make sure, without going into too much detail, that we all understand uh, procedurally where each one is. Um, the 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 Victory Hills trails did receive a jurisdictional opinion from the district coordinator. That case is on appeal to the Vermont uh, Superior Court Environmental Division. The Kingdom Trails um, has a, a request for a jurisdictional opinion. That has not been issued by a district coordinator yet. Um, both of these decisions, the one pen, the, both of these cases, the one currently pending before the environmental court, that's, that's Victory Hills, 
and the one that's currently pending uh, before the district coordinator have both been stayed pending um, uh, the adjournment of the legislature to see if anything that develops by way of a, a bill or an act might have some influence on the way that those uh, cases pan out ultimately. So I just wanted to give you that, that background and clarification. Okay. So the JO asserts Act 250 jurisdiction. Um, in one case, it's appealed. In the other case, they're considering appeal. Uh, well, um, well, the, excuse me, the other, the other case, Kingdom, nothing has yet been determined. Okay. So, so there's- The coordinator there's no, is still working on it. That's right. The coordinator is working on the Kingdom Trails, or, or it's not currently working on it because there is a stay until right. July 1st. Okay. Yeah. But so nothing's the, been decided with respect to Kingdom. Okay. So sure. I'm, I'm also looking at a, a May 30, 2017 JO for Kingdom Trails, uh, 7-280. So there's another one in process that has that, been issued. I believe that that JO you have in your hand is yep. for an entity called Kingdom South. Okay. Um, which was determined not to be part of Kingdom Trails. And that JO was final. Uh, it has not been appealed. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And um, when you say they've been stayed, who, who actually does the staying? Sure, that's who a good question. That? So uh, with respect to uh, Victory Hills, the, the court, the judge at the environmental division, upon agreement of the parties, stayed uh -huh. the matter. Okay. And a, sort of a similar process with respect to the Kingdom Trails JO currently at, currently be, being considered by the coordinator. The parties agreed to stay the matter until I think it was July 1st, sometime during the summer right. when we initially thought the legislature may have adjourned by, but of yes. course all of that has changed now. Okay, great. All right. Thank you for that extra sure. information. Um, any uh, other committee questions while we have this panel with us here this morning? Okay. Well, uh, so uh, Chair Snelling. Yes, I just wanted to say um, I'm happy to come back um, if you have more questions or want to discuss anything else about Act 250, uh, regardless of whatever action you may take this, this session. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for that. I'm. I'm I'm pretty confident that we will have to talk about it at least once more before we come to an agreement. So, uh, okay, great. All right. Um, well, with that, thanks everyone for uh, navigating the tricky waters of having JOs that are currently out there, a bill that's currently out there, but also sticking to a higher level discussion at the same time. So um, thanks for helping us uh, get a, a grounding and we will be uh, coming back to this issue again. So thank you to, to everyone. Uh, and if there's nothing else, we're adjourned until tomorrow at 10. Um, and I'll see you all on an all Senate caucus uh, in a few minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.